بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان علومك برحمتك يا رحم الراحم Alhamdulillah, we have tawfiq to start our fourth session in the series on Introduction to Islamic Mysticism. And as you know, this is based on the book by Ayatollah Mutahari. Uh, we reached the end of lesson three of the book. And as you remember, we were talking about the way Islamic scriptures and Islamic culture have inspired Muslim mystics. We mentioned verses of the Quran. We mentioned as an example a case from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Ayatollah Mutahari has two quotations from Nahjul Balaqa. There are many passages in Nahjul Balagha which relate to Islamic spirituality but in particular he mentions these two and I would like to uh, reflect all of us on these two beautiful passages of Nahjul Balagha actually in many of his lectures he used to refer to these two passages one is Sermon 218 when Imam Ali refers to uh, people who have embarked on the spiritual journey and how they start receiving inspirations by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قَدْ أَحْيَا أَقْلَهْ وَأَمَاتَ نَفْسَهْ he has revived his intellect and killed his nafs. As you know, we need to listen to our intellect. We need to put our intellect in charge of everything. And our lower desires should be all under the control and management and leadership of aql. Otherwise, it becomes like what we say in Dua'i Sabah that Aqli Maghloob wa Hawa'i Ghalib. So we don't want to be like that. We want our Aql to be dominant. So Imam Ali talks about the people that have revived their Aql and have killed their Nafsa Ammar, the soul which is not purified, which is commanding to do bad things. And this has not been for a short period of time. This has become a quality, an established quality, and therefore has changed their inner self. And their inner self has become very subtle and very uh, light and very gentle and therefore they are now in the best form for receiving like a soil when it is very dry it becomes very hard but when rain comes it becomes very soft so their 
inner self has become very gentle and very soft, very subtle. وَبَرَقَ لَهُ لَامِعٌ كَثِيرُ الْبَرَقِ Then, uh, like a thunder has happened to them that has uh, enlightened their heart. فَأَبَانَ لَهُ الطَّرِيقِ Now with this light, the path has become clear for them. وَسَلَكَ بِهِ السَّبِيلِ And this has put them on the road, on the journey. وَتَدَافَعَتُهُ الْأَبْوَابِ إِلَى بَابِ السَّلَامِ As you know, this journey has different stages. We have to go through different gates, different stations. So everything has pushed them gently to the very last uh, gate, which is Babu Salam, where you have reached the serenity, tranquility, peace, and you have Qalb Salim. Wadar al that is where you can really relax. Before you reach Darul Iqama, even if you want to stay there, you are not happy. You have to relax where it is prepared for this. وَثَبَتَتْ رِجْلَاهِ بِتُمَعْنِينَةِ بَدَنِهِ فِي قَرَارِ الْأَمْنِ وَالْرَاحَةِ When they reach there, when they pass Babu Salama and enter Darul Iqama, then their two feet now with tranquility of body can be firm there and they are in the station of security and comfort why because of what they have used their heart for and what they have tried to please their lord with so based on the way they have dedicated their heart to, and because of their commitment to please the Lord, now they reach the position that they can have absolute peace and serenity. Or in Khutbah 220 of Nahjul Balagha, Sermon 220, Amir al uh, among other things, has this passage. إن الله تعالى جعل الذكرى جلاء للقلوب. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has made His remembrance uh, the polishing of the heart. تسمع به بعد الوقرة وتبصر به بعد العشبة وتقاد وتنقاد به بعد المعاندة. At some point, our heart may become very hard, very difficult to understand, cannot hear the truth and understand the truth, cannot see, cannot be obedient. It's very hard, resistant, and stubborn, nothing at your control. Zikr can polish the heart, soften the heart, and make it in your control, very obedient, very much listening and attentive. So, after a kind of heaviness in ear, the heart starts listening properly. After a kind of cover and you know being blind, starts seeing. After being uh, hostile, it becomes very obedient. عزت أسماءه في البرهة بعد البرهة وفي أزمان الفترات صدور عباد الله سبحانه وتعالى may his names be dignified in every period in every era and in the times of fatra in the times that we think the world has not been very generous with spiritual gifts and having a spiritual figures. Even in those times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has people whose hearts are prepared and whose chests are opened up for receiving his gifts. So, Sharahallahu, 
صدور عباده الله has opened up the chest of some servants ناجاهم في قلوبهم الله whispers to them in their hearts normally مناجات is that we whisper to Allah سبحانه وتعالى but these are the people that Allah whispers to them Allah communicates to them but in the way that other people may not understand other people must hear from them they cannot understand firsthand and Allah talks to them but in their intellect it means that Allah facilitates for their intellects to come up with some understanding which at the same time which is very spiritual it's very rational so these are enlightened hokama so their language is language of philosophy and aql and logic فَأَسْبَهُ بِنُورِهِ يَقَضَةً فِي الْأَسْمَاعِ وَالْأَبْصَارِ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ So because of his light, they have become awake in their ears and eyes and hearts. You know, Allah says in the Quran, جَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ These are different uh, channels, different ways of our understanding. hearing, seeing, and through our hearts. So for these people, because of the light that they have received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their eyes, their ears, their hearts are all functioning at best. They are not sleeping. And therefore, they are able to function properly. Not dead, not sleeping, not sleepy, not having nap. They're sharp, they are alert. as they are already awake. يُذَكِّرُونَ بِأَيَّامِ الله. These are the people who remind other people. They are remembering Allah and they remind other people of the days of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Days in which Allah's presence in history of mankind was very much felt. These are days of God. يُخَفِّفُونَ مَقَامَهُ These are the people that remind people of greatness of Allah and therefore help them to develop positive fear and awe towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they act like guides but guide in the heart not someone who just talks people are so much listening to them and paying attention to them that even in their private times, in their heart, they receive guidance from these guides of people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ayatollah Mutahari says with sayings like this, with what we had in the Quran, how can then someone say Islamic mysticism is uh, foreign, is uh, imported and has nothing to do with Islam itself? He also then quotes uh, or refers to the du'as, to supplications that we have in Islam, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt. Du'a ya Kumail, du'a ya Abu Hamza Thumali, du'a ya, uh, you know, for example, iftata, uh, prayers in Sahifa ya Sajjadiya, Munajat Sha'baniya. These are all passages that any person who is Uh, interested in spirituality and come across comes across these du'as would not be able to ignore them would not be able to take them lightly uh, for example in Munajat Sha'baniya towards the end of the Munajat those beautiful uh, sentences about Ilahi al-Habli kamal al like وَأَنَرْ أَبْصَارَ قُلُوبِنَا بِضِيَاءِ النَّظَرَهَا إِلَيْكِ حَتَّى تَخْرِقَ أَبْصَارُ الْقُلُوبِ خُجُبَ النُّورِ وَتَسِلَ إِلَى مَعْدِنِ الْعَظَمَةِ وَتَسِيرَ أَرْوَاحُنَا مُعَلَّقَةً بِعِزِّ قُدْسِكِ He doesn't mention this passage. He mentions generally Munajat Sha'baniya. But you know this is a passage which the late Imam Khomeini, the teacher of Ayatollah Mutahari, used to recite a lot and 
in a period of teaching درس اخلاق uh, for some time he used to have every session ending with this or something like that oh Allah please let me join the light of your most exciting dignity another passage in Munajat Shabani so that I become a person who knows you fully who knows you in a very intimate way or Lots of beautiful passages in this Munajat Sha'bani and other places. So we can be sure that Islamic mysticism was in the first place inspired by Islam itself, by practice and character of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his true followers, especially Ahlul Bayt Alayhim But as we said, they had also interactions and exchange with other forms of spirituality later. And this is very natural, this is very normal. And Islam never closed the doors for exchange, for interactions with other cultures. And indeed, quite opposite. Islam has always encouraged that when it's a matter of learning, but it's a matter of benefiting from other people's uh, experiences, you should be happy to go even up to China. So this is the main uh, ideas in lesson three. And he ends this with uh, cite two citations from Nicholson. And Nicholson says that in the Quran, we see that God is the light of the skies and the earth. He is the first and the last. There is no one other than him. Everything other than him would perish and expire. God says he has blown into human beings from a spirit. God says that we are closer to man than his juggler Wayne. God says that we know what nafs and soul of man is uh, you know, uh, communicating to him. Wherever you turn your face, you find God there. If someone has not been given light by God, has no light. So Nicholson says, certainly the root and the origin of Sufism are these verses of the Quran. And for early Sufis, these were not only words of God, but they were means of getting near to God. So they used these words as means of spirituality and means of getting nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by uh, reflecting and contemplating on these verses of the Quran. And especially he mentions the verses about ascension of Prophet and how the Sufis try to somehow follow and somehow uh, be inspired by Mi'raj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, try to somehow experience mystical and Sufi experiences that they found the, pres pr the Prophet had in his life. He also says that the principles of unity in Sufism are mentioned everywhere in the Quran. And then he refers to Hadith Qurb Nawafil, the famous Hadith that we have mentioned also in uh, self-knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a divine saying in Hadith Qudsi, He says, my servants have never come closer to me like uh, the time when they have performed their wajibat, their obligatory acts. But then after that, they constantly come closer and closer to me till I love them. La yazal yataqarrabu ilayya abdi bin nawafil hatta uhibbah, till I love him. And we have mentioned uh, in several courses that Allah loves everyone, but for most of people, he loves them with reservation. 
because they have bad qualities or bad practices or bad habits. But these are the people that Allah loves them without hesitation, without reservation. Hatta uhabbah. Either because they have become pure or because even if they have impurities, they are working hard. There are two times that you can be 100% happy with a student. When that person gets the perfect result or when he shows and he demonstrates that he's working hard and there is nothing that he has reserved when it comes to studying. He has put all his energy and talents into it. So even if he gets uh, not the best result, but you are very happy with this student. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these people reach the point that hatta uhibba, till I love them. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ When I love them, then I become their ears by which they hear, their eyes by which they see. I become their hand by which they hold. And then he says, اِنْدَعَانِ أَجَبْتُهُ If he calls me, I answer. And he, if he asks me, سَأَلَّنِي أَعْطَيْتُهُ I grant him. This hadith of Qurban Nawafal, you don't find any book on Islamic spirituality unless they have this hadith. So this hadith, uh, Nicholson mentions that is one of those things that has inspired Muslim mystics and uh, Sufis. So the very last thing that Ayatollah Mutahari says is that uh, we are not uh, studying and dealing with the issue whether Sufis and uh, mystics have understood Islam 100% correctly or not, whether they have always uh, interpreted Islamic text or tradition completely or not. It's not the question. But the question is whether they were inspired by Islam or not, whether they had their origins in Islam or not. And the answer is yes. So now we have finished lesson three of the book and we go to lesson four, inshallah. Lesson four of Ayatollah Mutahari's introduction to Irfan is about history of Irfan. And he says that as we have said before, we want to carry on with studying Irfan as a cultural and scientific phenomenon in Islam. So we are not going to deal with the social aspect of Sufism. And he says, we are going to have a quick review of the first 10 centuries of Islam and we will refer to some of the key figures in these first 10 centuries. And then he says after that, uh, we will refer to some of the concepts and issues in Irfan. And then we will try to analyze some key points in Irfan. It seems uh, very obvious that in the first century of Islam, there was no group of Muslims who were called Sufis or Arifs. So it all must be starting with the second century. First half or second half, we'll talk about it, but certainly not in the first century. It is said that the very first person who was called Sufi was Abu Hashim Sufi Kufi. And he lived, he used to live in the second century of Islam. It is said that he was the very first person that in Ramla, in Palestine, made a monastery, a khanaqah, which is like monastery in Christian tradition for a community of worshippers to get together and worship God and dedicate their lives to serving God. It's not known exactly when he died. 
he used to be the teacher of Sofyanus Thuri. And Sofyanus Thuri was a, a person that lived in the time of Imam Sadiq salam. There is a story that we will refer to it later. Sofyan Thawri died in 161. So if Abu Hashim Sufi Kufi was teacher of Sofyan Thawri, he must have died earlier. But in any way, he is uh, the one that is, he has spent uh, his important part of life certainly in the second century. Abu Qasim Qushayri, who is himself a famous Sufi and Arif. Uh, we said before that uh, after some time, Sufi and Arif are used interchangeably. Uh, he says, Abu Qasim Qushayri says that the name Sufi must have come to existence by year 200. So it means that must be in the second century. Nicholson says that it must have come to existence in the late second century. Ayatollah Mutahari says from some hadith in Usul al Kafi or in Al Kafi Kitab al Ma'isha, maybe in Furu al Kafi Kitab al Ma'isha, uh, we find that Imam Sadiq alayhi uh, salam had an encounter with some. Uh, Sufis like Sufyan Thori, and this must be in the first half of the second century. And from this, we can understand that even in the first half of the second century, the name Sufi was already established or coined. Also, we said Abu Hashim Sufi was the teacher of Abu Sufyan Thori. Uh, the teacher of Sufyan Thori, and because Sufyan Thori died in 161, so he must also be uh, in the first uh, half of the second century. So there is good evidence to suggest that uh, Nicholson was not right to say that it was the second half of the second century. Why they were called Sufis? Suf in Arabic means wool. And Sufi is the one who, has, who puts on woolen dress because it was thick, it was not very soft and gentle, it was not like silk or co even cotton. It was something difficult, it was, you know, thick. And this was a sign of having ascetic life, a sign of having no interest in luxurious life. And this was uh, gradually a kind of uh, symbol and a kind of icon for this approach to life. So this was about emergence of the term Sufism or Sufi in Islam. What about Arif? Again, we are not 100% sure, but it's clear from some texts that it must be something that was there in the second century. For example, uh, if we uh, go to al by Abu Nasr Siraj Tusi, in his book al which is one of the very important uh, books in this field, it seems that in the first half of second century, the term Arif was used because he quotes something from Sufyan Thori which suggests this. So we can say first half of second century, like the term Sufi. But Sari Sekhti, who died in 243, he says that this was available in the third century. Maybe we can say it had started in the second century, but was more you know, predominant in the third century. What is important is that uh, in the first century, definitely we didn't have neither 
term Sufi nor Arif in the sense that we understand today. But this doesn't mean that among Muslims in the first century, like some of the companions of the Prophet, there were no uh, people with deep spiritual life. And they were just, you know, having simple life in a spirituality. No. Some of them were very deeply involved in spirituality and there were actually differences. For example, Ayatollah Mutahari refers to the difference between Abu Dhar and Salman. Uh, although both of them are very respected, both of them are uh, examples for believers, but we know that Salman was higher in his degree of Iman to the extent that Hadith says, uh, Abu Dhar, لو علم أبو ذر ما في قلب سلمان لقتله أو لكفره أو لترحم على قاتله. If Abu Dhar knew what was in the heart of Salman, maybe would have killed him or would have, you know, said Salman is not kafir, because uh, there are levels of understanding that are so delicate and so subtle that if someone has not reached that level. It's not that just doesn't understand them, may misunderstand them, and may think they have gone actually uh, out of uh, Islam. They have become kafir. Even someone like Abu Dhar, that no one doubts his sincerity. And the Prophet said that the sky has not uh, been above any person who is more truthful and more frank uh, in his speech or more honest in his speech than Abu Dhar, something like this. So no doubt about Abu Dhar's uh, Iman, but even Abu Dhar is not at the level of Salman. So it shows that there were deep uh, spiritual uh, figures at that time. Inshallah, in the next episode, we will try to review quickly generations of Sufis and mystics from the, from the second century, which is the first century of emergence, of Sufism up to the 10th century, inshallah. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the soul of Ayatollah Mutahari and all our ulama and enable us to follow their path. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam.